Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Committee for Justice's virtual panel discussion, the Supreme Court's ruling in Axon and the future of FTC litigation. I am your host, Ashley Baker, and I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Committee for Justice. I will now introduce our panelists in the order they will be speaking. Richard Epstein, who really doesn't need much of an introduction here, but, uh, Professor Epstein is in the inaugural Lawrence Tisch Professor of Law at NYU School of Law. Prior to his joining the faculty, he was a visiting law professor at NYU from 2007 through 2009. He has served as the Peter and Kristen Bedford Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution since 2000. Epstein is also the James Parker Hall of Distinguished Service Professor of Law Emeritus and a senior lecturer at the University of Chicago. Professor Epstein has written numerous articles on a wide range of subjects and a wide range of legal and interdisciplinary subjects. He has taught courses in administrative law, antitrust law, civil procedure, communications, constitutional law, contracts, and a vast array of other areas. Ashish Agarwal is an attorney who has served in senior roles at the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. At the FTC, Agarwal served as Assistant Director at the Office of Policy Planning, where he led initiatives to help consumers and ex examine the barriers to the growth of e-commerce. Ashish currently serves as an advisor to the American Edge Project on competition issues. The brief presentations by our panelists will be followed by a discussion, after which we will open up the floor for audience Q&A. If you have a question that you'd like to go ahead and send to me during the panel, um, please go ahead and send it to me via the Q&A function on the webinar. Um, that way I can incorporate that at the end of our um, discussion. That's the best way to send me questions is through the Q&A function. Um, just type it in your Zoom browser. So first, I'm just going to give a little bit of very, very brief background on the case. So this past Friday on April 14th, the Supreme Court held that federal district courts have jurisdiction to hear constitutional challenges to agency administrative proceedings. Um, this was in the opinion we're talking about, Axon versus um, Federal Trade Commission, and it was combined with a similar case related to the SEC, although we're going to talk a little bit more about the FTC today and the implications there. But the court's decision in Axon will allow defendants to raise constitutional challenges in federal court without having to first wade through the agency's internal administrative process, which could take many years in some cases. So writing unanimously for the court, Justice Hagan's opinion stated that the statutory review scheme set out in the Securities Exchange Act and the Federal Trade Commission Act do not displace a district court's federal question jurisdiction over claims challenging as constitutional the structure or existence of the SEC or the FTC. The ordinary statutory review scheme, scheme, she wrote, does not preclude a district court from entertaining these extraordinary claims. And in addition to Justice Kagan's opinion for the majority, Justice Thomas filed a concurring opinion, and Justice Gorsuch filed an opinion concurring in the judgment. Um, Kagan also, in writing for all the justices except for technically Justice Neil Gorsuch, treats the case as a straightforward application mm -hmm. of a framework established in the court's 1994 decision in Thunder Basin. Um, Judge Tom Justice Thomas joins Kagan's opinion, but would reject the more broadly the constitutionality of the deferential review of the agency decisions on appeal. Um, he had a lot of broader concerns um, related to the Federal Trade Commission's and the SEC's processes. And while Gorsuch um, would just outright reject um, Thunder Basin entirely and recognize an even broader right to district court review of agency processes. So one last note, as a practical matter, the court's decision in Axon means that any target of FTC enforcement or FTC rulemaking will not have to wade through these years of um, administrative litigation before challenging the agency in federal court. So with this in mind, it's also notable that the FTC is currently engaging one of the most aggressive agendas in its history. So our panel of experts are going to discuss the Supreme Court's opinion as well, the as well as the implications more broadly for the Federal Trade Commission for litigation faced by the Federal Trade Commission and some of the cases that they have brought recently. And with that, I'm going to turn it over first to Professor Epstein just to get your initial reactions yeah. on the opinion in the case. Okay, well, it's very great, nice to be here because it's a very important day in the history of administrative law. And I first said when I saw this opinion came down nine nothing, and it took two agencies, both of which need a big thrashing in order to put them back into order. I said, all was well in the United States Supreme Court. They've now come together on an issue which requires uh, exactly this treatment. 
So with respect to the ultimate issue in the case as to whether or not you can mount a constitutional challenge to the jurisdiction of an administrative agency before you are taken through the ringer by that agency, I think that principle is actually unex absolutely unexceptionable. And one of the things I noted, however, is that there are many parallels to the same problem, which were left widely untouched, completely untouched in this case. So for example, under section 1983 action, uh, the question is whether or not if you have some challenge to the jurisdiction, you could go to court first, or do you first have to exhaust your administrative remedies? And the answer to that is pretty emphatically that you don't have to uh, exhaust those administrative agencies. You can make the facial challenge right away. And right recently, the same thing has taken place with respect to these endless dis reviews by land use planning commissions on what you can and cannot do. Uh, if you want to make a challenge, you don't have to exhaust all the administrative agency, which could leave you dead. If you actually look at some of the cases involved in this particular area, Lucia is the one I think which is most conspicuous. What happened is essentially uh, the uh, there's a very extraordinary attack. Justice Kagan, I believe, wrote the opinion where she says, well, this was an improperly appointed fellow. We have to start off all over. That's not a remedy. That's just basically uh, relitigating the same case because it's an easy matter uh, for the uh, SEC to find the right person to give orders to everybody. And so poor Mr. Lucy was put through the ringer a second time and ended up making a very disadvantageous settlement because litigating against the government, which wants to give a threat to everybody else, means that they're gonna spend an enormous amount of resources and people will eventually cave. So the outcome, it seems to me, is utterly beyond doubt in this case. And the question is, how would you want to phrase it? I'm very simple-minded. I think, in effect, that you cannot have an acceptable set of, pro of processes if, in fact, you have to go through the ringer before you could challenge the jurisdiction of a particular court or an agency. And the due process argument just strikes me as being perfectly ubiquitous on the one hand and powerful in all these cases, given all the variation. That's not what we got when we got the opinion from Justice Kagan. What we got was an exercise on separation of powers, having to do largely with the various sorts of cases that essentially uh, say, is the person who's in charge of the administrative agency sufficiently insulated from presidential review that it violates the principles of separation of power. This, this strikes me as being utterly irrelevant in terms of the way in which you want to talk about these issues. To put the hypothetical in its simplest form, suppose it turns out that we had contained the statutes and we had the FTC commissioners and the SEC commissioners absolutely removable at the drop of a hat by President Biden. Uh, that's not going to happen, of course. He's going to cheer them on the way he's done all the time. So the fact that he could remove them but not do anything to protect this particular party, they would still be exposed to the relentless situation here. So the question really isn't the relationship of the agency to the president. The question is the relationship of the agencies to the people. And this is, of course, I think extremely important because I think one of the serious issues that we have today is that we have a president that's too powerful. Uh, does too many things by executive orders, controls too many areas, can act with a kind of unilateral sense of purpose that Congress cannot. And the independent agencies, uh, certainly looking at it somewhat in retrospect, actually give you an independent check on what it is that the president can do, and in effect, give you some kind of check on what it is that the Congress can do as well. So I don't have, with respect to agencies that are proper commissions, the five members all operating, which is not the case today with the FTC, and probably not with this SEC as well, uh, I'm okay uh, with having that particular power. But then the question is, what is it that you want to do? Well, for the Supreme Court, uh, they go through this kind of ridiculous sort of charade um, about why it is we don't allow this. The first thing they said as well, is the right going to be something which you really need to exercise at this point to be effective? The answer is yes. That's exactly what the case is. End of story. It seems to me that you don't have to talk about anything else in order to explain why we're not going to have uh, the ringer given to you before you could appeal this thing. And the thought that somehow or other you're going to uh, treat an authorization statute as implying repeal the general access to federal court when it creates this horrific result seems to me to be by and large inexcusable. But then they start talking about something having to do with collateral consequences and so forth. All that is what they're saying is, if the issue goes to jurisdiction rather than to the merits of the case, uh, you should be entitled to go into court. So it's perfectly correct, but it's kind of an obscure way to say it. And then what they do is they start saying, well, what about the confidence? 
And there's this extraordinary line in the case uh, coming forth from Justice Kagan. Everybody admits that the, SC, the FTC and the SEC have no confidence on matters of separation of powers. I mean, I could not think of a stupider statement to make as a matter of undisputed fact when that's all these guys spend their lives doing, litigating these cases, beating people over the head. It's like saying about an ordinary lawyer in torts, well, you really are very good at torts, but you know nothing about civil procedure or class actions about jurisdiction. Come on, smell the coffee. It's not the case. These guys know all too much about this. The reason we don't want them to win is not that they're ineffective, it's because they're very effective when they're given their particular way. So in the end, I think what happens is this opinion gets to the right result. I think in the end, it will lead to the ultimate right result, which is sooner or later, the Supreme Court will come to the conclusion that in all these cases, due process requires that adjudication of major claims against the particular person brought by an agency cannot be adjudicated inside that agency. Uh, that's the case with respect to the FTC and the SEC, where you appoint your own judges or decide your own complaints. It's just an utter offense to any elementary notion of due process. And this case gets you partway down the road, but we haven't heard the hammer drop. So what we need to do is to have another case. I hope it's sooner rather than later, which says, and because we do this, we now recognize that in each and every case, the idea that an agency could be both a prosecutor and a judge is utterly indefensible, and so require these cases to go to independent courts. Now, there's here, just to make a couple of other points, uh, one of the things is the very odd decision of Justice Thomas. Uh, why is it odd? It's not because it's incorrect. I um, mean, he's quite right to express these deep constitutional reservations about all of this stuff. But he was the man, if you recall, who wrote the oil states opinion, which was one of the worst opinions ever penned by the United States Supreme Court, in which he managed to distinguish case after case, all of which held for the exact same proposition one's contending here. If it turns out that the PTO wants to take back a patent that it's already issued, it can't do it in its own court. It has to go to public court, like any other party who makes a grant, which is going to be subject to revocation. And that's the way the case law had always been held. But here, he's much more the individual rights guy, and it comes out the right way. Justice Gorsuch, I think, bless him in this particular case. He says, I can't think why this thundercloud opinion has the slightest relevance to anything that we're doing here. And he's right about that as well. Uh, this is the sort of thing that we don't want to depend upon peculiarities of administrative law. We want to have a broad constitutional case. And just before I stop, I would mention one of the distressing elements of Justice Kagan's opinion. She kept on saying that this is just a matter of interpreting congressional intent. And the great emphasis upon congressional intent necessarily undermines the constitutional issues on which this case ultimately properly should extend. So the opinion is a bit of a muddle. The outcome is un 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 unequivocally right. Uh, the way in which you want to get there, I think, is much too obscure and much too convoluted. Uh, but I think eventually the Supreme Court will come to its senses and recognize that the new wave of administrative superiority is really something that's completely unacceptable. This is not an argument against regulation. This is an argument against adjudication that takes place before the very pattern which starts to bring the complaint decides the issue, and that's just unacceptable. So I'll stop there, and Aish can, so explain, Aish can now explain why it is that I'm simply too extreme in my opinions. Well, Ashley, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for moderating and thank the Committee of Justice for, push, for pushing this together. Oh, P Professor Epstein, I, I, there's very little on which I disagree with you. I might frame it slightly differently. So here's, I'll give you my gloss on the uh, the various opinions and then um, a couple of thoughts on its, uh, its possible implications. So in terms of the opinion, look, I, I you know, completely agree that uh, you know the court got it right. This is the second 9-0 loss for the FTC in the last few years. Uh, they lost another case called um, you know AMG, uh, you know just a, just a couple of years ago. Which the court also found that the FTC had overreached in terms of its uh, statutory uh, you know authority. Here, I think from Justice Kagan's opinion is one I think is one that you would uh, you know ex expect you know from her in talking about administrative law. It is a careful uh, recitation of you know the case law as compare as relates to these multi factor tests, um, you know, from the you know, 1980s and 1990s, you know, Th Thunder Basin and Elgin, and it goes through. And I think she does reach the right result, which is that the FTC, you know, doesn't have any particular 
you know, expertise or competence in reaching, you know, the question of its constitutional authority. And although, you know, the litigants do alt can ultimately get to court, there's no reason uh, to, you know, to hold that up for the FTC's, you know, ALJ to opine on whether, um, you know, on, on, on whether the FTC's processes are constitutional or not. Um, I think that there are, you know, a couple of implications for the court's decision. Num number one, I do think that on a going forward basis, it is going to be slightly easier for you know, litigants or those subject to the FTC's jurisdiction to be able to challenge the FTC directly in federal court, circumventing the ALJ process. And there is some of that language in Justice Kagan's you know, very, very careful opinion. And she talks about how uh, there's really no need for uh, the FTC internally to adjudicate the scope of its legal authority. And she says when the FTC is arguably acting outside of that authority and her language isn't limited solely to constitutional challenges, uh, it's, uh, you know, it might make sense to go straight to uh, straight to federal court. That is certainly uh, the tenor of Justice Thomas's opinion. And when she talks about this distinction between, you know, public rights versus private rights, and he basically implicates very clearly that when an entity or a party is the subject to, uh, to a law enforcement action that could impose you know, financial penalties that could, you know, result in loss of intellectual property, that is the sort of case that, uh, you know, should uh, should go before an Article Three judge. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to see, you know, a number of, um, you know, a, a number of litigants, you know, ma make that argument directly. And of course, Justice Gorsuch, is, as, you, as you said, said this is just a straightforward application of federal question jurisdiction. By the way, if you're interested, as if you haven't had a chance to read these opinions, if you're interested for a for a strong exercise in, in uh, judicial sarcasm, very much encourage you to read Justice Gorsuch's opinion. He takes to task um, some of the Supreme Court's prior precedents in this area. But what he says basically is that if um, you are raising, you know, a you know, you know, federal constitutional challenge to the agency, you can bring that directly in federal court. I think this case has broader implications, though, for uh, some of Chair Khan's agenda, for example. There are a number of rulemakings. Uh, that are in the pipeline, uh, you know, to ban non-competes, to ban, um, you know, what what she calls, uh, you know, com commercial surveillance. I think all of those things are going to be easier for regulated parties to go directly into federal court now. I also think that this uh, case, you know, raises some implications for Humphrey's executor, which is the case that you know, 100 years ago, upheld the constitutionality of the FTC. The court declined to um, grant certiorari on that question, which Axon had requested, but certainly Justice Thomas's opinion leaves a lot of questions, you know, makes it clear that he has a lot of questions as to the court's ongoing constitutionality and you know, the very idea of melding these, you know, executive, legislative, and, you know, quasi-judicial um, you know, powers all in one agency. I think that is squarely on the table. Uh, certainly in, you know, in Axon itself. Um, uh, you know, also, also, there's, you know, the, the, the SEC case is part of that, but certainly in related cases, the, um, you know, there's a, a, a case that's gotten a lot of coverage, Illumina versus Grail, which is headed to the Fifth Circuit, in which uh, the parties there are, are, are you know, raising some of these same sorts of constitutional issues. And third and finally, I just want to say, I think that and Professor Epstein touched upon this, I think the case raises some real questions about the, just the role of ALJs in our uh, just just in our system of uh, you know case adjudication generally, because I'll tell you one one of the role one of my prior roles in government this was this was pure public service was a general counsel to the Social Security Administration, which is a benefits granting organization. Social Security Administration has eighteen hundred ALJs. Somebody has to make those decisions as to who is eligible for benefits or not, and it probably should be somebody in the executive branch subject to some level of judicial review. But for things like you know, law enforcement actions brought by the FTC or the SEC, certainly Justice Thomas's opinion squarely raises whether those cases should be brought in federal court or administratively. So I, I also had some some kind of mixed feelings about the, this um, opinion. Oh, professor, like, you're, also... you're, uh, professor you're, uh, you're muted. Oh, go ahead. Don't meet your professor. <laughs> there you go. Ashley, I defer to you. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just saying, I too had some some pretty mixed feelings about this opinion. Uh, like Professor Epstein and I very much like the outcome, um, the way in which we got there, which Kagan just, you know, made this such a strict application just under reason. And I, I agree with um with Justice Gorsuch and that we need not reach those factors. But um, it didn't grapple with these 
um, very like these due, due process questions that really were at the core of the case. Um, and she, she really didn't even go there. And like in the amicus brief that we filed, the Committee for Justice filed it in um, Axon, in this case, we, we kind of talk about these issues a bit and, you know, what is meaningful due process at the end of years before an ALJ? Um, if you can't bring that constitutional claim in federal court, then, you know, what what's the point? What due process do you have? Um, I quoted at the time, it was um, one of the former FCC commissioners, Donovan, who was acquitted of, I believe, fraud charges at the time. And he says, you know, what agency do I go to to get my reputation back? At the end of the you know, process, you like in, in many cases, there is not a company left. I mean, look at what happened to LabMD. There are countless other examples. And it seems that this will create a coming storm of litigation in federal court. But uh, I was going to ask kind of each of you what um, kind of if you can kind of lay out the situation with the current FTC and what cases they have brought recently and, you know, what their win or loss rate has been in those part three proceedings and, you know, what we might see next. I know that's a very broad question. Yeah, <laughs> I'll let Professor Obstein go first. Yeah, I, I, I want to comment on that. And, and it's in the same direction. And she's also talked about another one of my least favorite decisions of the FTC, the Illumina Grail case. But let me just go back a little bit further on this. I mean, uh, one of the things that I want to say is I think, in effect, there are two separate questions that to some extent get smushed together. One of them is, uh, the question of when can you go to court before you go within the agency? And the other is the question of what kind of issues do agencies have genuine expertise on? And essentially, the argument that I would make, so long as the question is jurisdictional as to whether the agency can hear this thing consistent with its constitutional powers, you have to go to court first before you can actually run it through. But there are going to be many questions inside the agency. Does this or this is not substantially lessen competition and so forth? And here, the thing that I would want to say is uh, the same thing that Justice Kagan said about these guys on separation of powers and jurisdiction, I would apply to all matters of substantive law. That is, I do not think that any agency has a kind of a systematic expertise on the legal questions associated with its operation, jurisdiction, the interpretation of contracts and statute, which is better than that of a federal court. I think their agencies, their expertise lies on sort of factual determinations, maybe, although oftentimes they're so politicized they don't do that right. And so I would think that that labor should, that she gave should be an opening invitation to reconsider from yet another point of view, the Chevron doctrine uh, of deference on this. No reason whatsoever to defer to an agency which has got an agenda a mile deep and a mile high and a mile wide uh, to defer to their so-called expertise when pack their brush with weaponizing everything that they start to do. And I think the more political these agencies become, the more we know that there's always splits along party lines and the rest of it. We should say agencies are the repository of bias because what happens is they have a single class of issue. You can point your guys to the agency. You're going to go down the line every way that you want them. And you start getting these very dangerous three to two switches. This, of course, then also ties up with the major questions doctrine. And I think, in effect, the major questions doctrine needs one modification. It should become the major and minor questions doctrine with respect to matters of law. Uh, that is, the way I read it, it's a kind of a large exception that's being created the Chevron of uncertain dimension. And a lot of the critics of the doctrine say, oh, my God, we don't know where this ends and where it's begin. The line is unadministrable. Let's assume that that's true, which is probably false, but assume it's true anyhow. Then the correct thing to do is to understand that Chevron made the fundamental mistake when it took all questions of law and deferred to agencies and let them become masters of their own roost. That's essentially the fundamental thing. Other thing I wanted to mention about Justice Thomas's opinion, he said there that line that this is not a case of public rights because he was referring to the oil case case. But his definition of public rights in oil state was utterly indefensible. It was any right that was created by statute then becomes essentially a public right. Well, you just take over the entire field. What was going on in the earlier cases is that this was the government having to assert claims with respect to its own jurisdiction, claiming, for example, that certain taxes were owed under the customs laws of things of that sort. Far narrower than the definition that he gave of the term. And so I think what happens is he has to agree to cut this thing back. Otherwise, what he's doing is he's taking away through the broad definition of the 
public right the very kind of insights that he creates for these so-called private law cases. There's nothing about this case that redeems oil state. It's exactly the same kind of a situation. You have a patent heavily contested in federal district court. The agency says, we would like to sleep. They can appoint any panel that they want. And lo and behold, what they decide is their original determination was correct. It's again, it's the same sort of incestuous behavior that you ought not to allow under these cases. So I think in effect, what we have to say about Justice Kagan is that she's temporizing too much. Right instincts, wrong logic. I don't know if she's, am I wrong about this or am I again, going too far over the top? No, I, I would agree with you. I, I, I agree I that, the, that, the, uh, the, the, that the case as a whole does re really call into the question the, uh, you know, the utility of ALJs in these sorts of cases that the FTC is called the part three administrative process, whereby you have, you know, the, the commission, the five commissioners will, you know, vote out a complaint and sort of, you know, you know go, go, go away as the, as the uh, case is litigated before the ALJ. And then they, they come back in you know, part three and they sit as judge, effectively as judges, um, you know, as, as, as an appellate body over the decision of the ALJ. You know, what, what, what utility um, you know, it, it is is that these days, you know, the FTC in several recent cases has overturned its own, its own ALJ, Illumina Grail, mm -hmm. we've talked about, the, the Jewel case we've talked about. And, you know, when they do go to federal court, uh, they've they've had enough, uh, an uphill climb. Most recently, they lost, uh, you know, the Meadow Within case. And part of that is because, you know, certainly recently, the FTC has, um, you know, adopted some you know, pretty, pretty aggressive theories. Um, you know, untied from, you know, traditional you know, antitrust law, the consumer welfare standard, et cetera. Now they have this, you know, very aggressive interpretation of Section 5 of the FTC Act, which in their view allows them to declare, uh, you know, really any competitive practice as, you know, an unfair method of competition, including things like, you know, a loyalty rebate could be, you know, un un unfair according to them. So on a going forward basis, it's going to be very interesting. And to your point, Professor, whether courts give you know, really any deference at all to the agency, you know, now it's, you know, it's not a three-two agency; it's a three-zero agency. With all of the current commissioners are appointed by you know the president of one party. Um, you have you know increasing concerns about uh, you know executive over you know executive overreach about executive agency overreach, which you, you've seen you know, articulated in. You know, the major questions dark doctrine that's you know West Virginia versus EVA that's a Jarkisi case a Jarkisi case out of uh, you know out of the yeah. fifth circuit which involve, involves the F, F yeah. involves the SEC and so on a going forward basis you have a commission that's now uh, certainly perceived as being very political that is you know exercising um, its you know authority over the antitrust laws in ways that uh, really break from four decades of precedent it's not clear at all that you know, federal courts are going to one give the agency deference, or see, or two, you know, see the ongoing utility of the uh, ALJ process at all. Well, you're not going to get rid of the ALJs, I think, for the reason that was mentioned before. You have to run agencies like Social Security, and there you don't have the same stakes. You have hundreds of thousands of cases, all of which have great complexity but small dollar figures there is perhaps some kind of bias in the agency, but it's very difficult to figure out what it is. And the track records that you find on individual judges uh, don't, I think, allow you to do things selectively. The one reform I would insist upon, if it's not already practiced there, is that all cases when there are many administrative law judges be assigned by rotation uh, so that you don't get to pick somebody to put onto a panel if you think that a case is some interpretation. And that was done, of course, in oil states, where you keep on expanding the size of the panel until you get the mix of the people whom you want, which is an utter offensive due process. I will appoint to the panel the judge who most carefully agrees with me. And in the end, if that turns out to me, then I'll be put myself on the particular panel inside the PTAB. So I, she's, I think, and, and Ashley, the, the internal operations of the social security system and the patent system given the frequency of cases and the size of individual cases, seem to call for different kinds of administrative solutions. So am I right or wrong about well, that? That's, that's exactly right. So, I mean, the Social Security Administration has something like 1,800 ALJs, and their decisions you know, funnel up to something like um, 18,000 federal court cases every year. So clearly for an agency like that, for uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs, which also makes benefit mm -hmm. determination, I agree, you need some decision makers, whether you call them ALJs or hearing officers or whatever that makes mm -hmm. sense. But Professor, do you think that an agency, you know, let, 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 let's call it for now a law enforcement agency like the FTC, like the, like the SEC, do they need 
um, you know, does it make sense from a standpoint of resolving disputes for those agencies to have their own in-house adjudicators? No, in, in I think exactly of, the opposite. I think it just becomes overpowering. Let's go back to Illumina Grail. Um, because remember, there was an administrative judge in that case, and he wrote a very strong opinion saying uh, the risk of foreclosure, as far as I can see, is highly remote uh, because there are no existing competitors out there who could use it. And of course, there are these contractual guarantees that have been warded. I would say the administrative law judge probably cited Dennis Carlton's opinion. He's a good friend of mine and an eminent economist who does as much expert testifying on industrial organizations as anybody else. He must have cited him a dozen or two dozen times. Come up to the opinion that the agency does, it's much longer. And all of a sudden, every argument that was made by Dennis Carlton, every argument that was made by the ALJ in that case, just disappeared from the woodwork. And what you got in effect was this kind of statement about potential harm. And I, I think it's really important to state what the SEC position is because it's absolutely bonkers. I think they have a strong argument that the restrictive practices of all mergers should be regarded as presumptively stronger than any efficiency gains that are going to be made, regardless of the contractual adjustments that parties are willing to put into place and to bind themselves. And I think that position, uh, it just completely gets everything wrong on the way in which the world has worked. I thought the Illumina Grail transaction, when they put the various kinds of guardrails in there, offering most favored nation clauses and things like that, should have put it to an end. When they say, well, you could revoke these clauses, this is what I would say. If you really think these clauses are critical, which is what the defendants did, and then when you say if they refuse to honor them as things go forward, it's like changing the terms of the original merger. And that would then become the removal of those provisions itself an antitrust violation. So the FTC could enforce it at that time instead of any other. Uh, I don't know whether this is right or wrong, but I think it makes a lot of sense. What I am very confident about is there was nobody inside the FTC who took the other side. I thought uh, Judge you know, Christine Wilson I was very disappointed in that opinion. I mean, because she didn't really attract the transaction. She says, please don't go back and rely on brown shoe. You know, one of the terrible opinions from the early 1960s that was ultimately undone by the consumer welfare standard. So um, I think no matter how you look at all of this stuff, what happens is every one of these agencies needs to get a comeuppance. And the one thing I would add is the same thing has to be done with respect to executive orders. There is no legitimacy to an executive order, in my view, which decides to create substantive policy beyond the term of the current president, trying to tell us what automobiles should look like in 2035, and none whatsoever with respect to substantive provisions, which essentially trying to sneak out some general statutory authorization uh, to say that we can do this particular thing, like ending the use of standard automobiles, com internal combustion evidence by 2035 or 2040, whatever the date is. I think the whole thing is part of the same piece and that the same response should be done for the same thing. I'm just curious whether you guys agree with that. Oh, you're well, so cautious. There's, there's, there, there, there's a lot there. I will, I, I will pick up on one thread of that, which is, um, you know, the ongoing, you know, utility or lack thereof in, you know, ALJs, you know, making administrative, uh, you know, decisions. I think the, the, you know, the original idea, if you go back to, you know, Humphrey's executor and the creation of the FTC, mm -hmm. the idea is you have this body of experts with deep industry expertise who would be able to you know, both provide you know, constructive guidance to the uh, you know, to, to, to the business community, but also to advise you know, you know, you know, policymaker, you know, some Congress and the president as to how things should operate. And if you look at how the FTC has evolved over time, that model, you know, really hasn't you know, borne out over time. You know, you have uh, you know three commissioners now who are all uh, you know very very you know, obviously you know accomplished people. Um, uh, you know, whip smart, but n none of whom have actually spent any meaningful amount of time working in the private sector. And if you go back to, you know, you know, you know President Wilson, when he created the FTC, that, that's not his vision for what, you know, the Federal Trade Commission, you know, was supposed to be. And that's not actually, you know, the, the, you know, the basis on what it was and on how it was upheld by the Supreme Court. It wasn't supposed to be, you know, a political party political body is supposed to be, you know, very objective with, you know, people with deep mm -hmm. industry. And so now you have, you know, an FTC that is, you know, the commission that is regularly overturning, um, you know, it's ALJ, who actually does have, you know, a fair amount of, 
you know, experience you know, s- several decades now, you know, adjudicating these antitrust cases. So it does strike me that the, you know, the value to the court system of getting sort of you know, agency expertise isn't quite what it used to be, or at least what it was envisioned as. There's also, I think, another reason this is true. Um, uh, it turns out we have a genuine despotic impulse in Lena Khan when it comes to the way in which power is distributed inside the agency. There have been public stories about the level of support that she has from people down below, uh, that it's, the agency has no longer got the support of its people at the various desks and so forth, that many of them are now stripped of final authority to make cases. It all goes back up to Ms. Khan and her two buddies at the top of these kinds of things and so forth, uh, that people are being forced out of offices. I can't verify any of these stories, but they have certainly been repeated more than once or twice. And so what happens is you see somebody who essentially is trying to take an agency which had distributed powers and concentrate all of the important decision-making at the peak. And since the three of them are absolutely homogenous, it turns out it's like a one-woman agency trying to run the world. So I think all of the legitimacy associated with this operation is disappeared. I feel the same thing about the SEC, given the way in which it has started to work. One just starts to look at its views on carbon. Dioxide. Now, we, this is not a place to get into a discourse about global warming and so forth. Uh, so I'll just mention one thing. Uh, you look at the last 10 years, there's no increase in aggregate temperature, just a bunch of up and downs starting from about you know, 2014 or so. Um, and this says, now to the fire engines, everything has to go. So not only do you have to report about your own emissions, you have to report about everybody else's emissions. Why do we do this? Well, this is not to help investors. They do not care about the expected value of the shot from global warming in 2060 or 2050. That's not their concern. They worry about much more immediate things. But then she says, well, the public might care. Well, we know that the public, for the most part, is relatively indifferent to global warming. If you tell them to monetize how much they're going to have to pay uh, to reduce the temperature by 0.1% of a degree in you know, 2050, they're not going to pay a lot of money. So what the agency does is essentially it refers to its willingness to serve the public when all it's doing is serving itself. And so what you do is you get these real cases, not of simply gradual mission creep, not just a broad definition. Well, does the security interest cover a limited partnership interest of things like this, which it probably does. It's just going the whole hog on this and very, very far. So what we do is we're seeing this all the way throughout the administrative state. And there's no legitimacy to these people when it comes to that, which is why it is that a presumption of deference, uh, which make some sense where you believe in genuine expertise does not work in a situation where you think there's no evidence of expertise at all. What is Ms. Khan's credentials coming into this? She wrote this rather dreadful but highly influential article in the Yale Law Journal, uh, which essentially repeated all the standard stuff about the 1930s, uh, kind of robinson Patman price support situation, protect the little competitor and things like that. That's not enough of a resume to let you mistransform the world. Um, And so I think what we really have to do is to say, given the way that you people did, whatever assumptions we may have had about the Wilsonian virtues of the administrative expertise state, uh, subject to democratic pressures, no longer applies, so the deference has to disappear. And going back to kind of how federal judges are going are going to look at this, I mean, obviously, we're going to have a lot more litigation in federal courts following the Axon decision, but um, kind of to both of your points, it's that we have this, you know, first one, the equivalent of a, you know, basically the equivalent of a fifth year law associate making these partisan 3-0 decisions, um, often overruling staff, which I mean, it, it's fine to overrule staff, I think you, but you better be explain, better be able to explain why. And I mean, she can talk to this more better than I can having been at the FTC, but I feel like it's very rare that the staff is the one saying, oh, wait, this lawsuit is not, you know, good enough. Let's not litigate. And whereas usually it's the commissioner saying, you know, making these political considerations or other considerations saying, oh, okay, let's, you know, pull back the reins a little bit. I don't know if we want to, you know, go forth with this. Whereas the staff, you know, they want to litigate and that's their job. So if they're kind of saying, hold on, um, that's a problem. And also just, you know, what Richard was saying about the, you know, limited case, for example, overruling its own ELJ. It happens from time to time, but it's happening a lot now. 
Um, and these merger guidelines, for example, don't have the force of law. They are basically, you know, relying on the reputational capital of the FTC that they built up over the years with these federal judges to say, okay, well, we're going to defer to these guidelines. But if they're contradicting themselves, if they're acting as a 3 0 body, then I can't see how they will possibly defer to the FTC in the future when they don't have to do that, when the FTC is basically playing ping pong. Yeah, Ashley, you know, my, my, my perspective on that is that the, 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 the fundamental problem is that the FTC has quasi-judicial, quasi quasi-legislative, and quasi-executive power. Because look, at one level, you know, elections have consequences. And I think it is, I think it's appropriate for an agency head to set the direction for an agency. It is not necessarily inappropriate for an agency head to overrule career staff. Look, I've served in Republican administrations, and that's that's often a criticism of Republican administration. Oh my gosh, you're, you're you're overruling the career staff and this you know this this or other decision. Have heaven for fend. Well, that's how that that's how that's how it it is it is supposed to work. Decisions funnel up to the funnel up to the agency head. The fundamental problem, though, is as I see it, um, you know, with the, with the current leadership, is they are you know divorcing their leadership from um, you know any sort of you know history precedent statutory constraints. So their vision of what the FTC can do is essentially, you know, a mini legislature that can dictate terms of commerce across the, you know, you know across the entire U.S. economy. That's a stretch. And they're doing it without any sort of, um, you know, you know, basis in, you know, you know, empirical fact finding. Typically when the FTC has made a rule, certainly this was the, the case when I was there, um, you know, you, you would have this process involving your economists, involving your competition and consumer protection people. You'd get them all to some sort of consensus. And while you wouldn't always have unanimity in things on anything significant that the agency would do, you actually would try to get, uh, you know, some meaningful input and feedback from minority commissioners. Whereas here, uh, you know, they've acted in such a, in such, such a unilateral fashion, they drove out of office, you know, the one remaining uh, you know, Republican commissioner who said she was, who resigned in protest saying that she wasn't allowed to do her job. So I think, you know, on a going forward basis, you know, certainly Justice Thomas's opinion, um, uh, you know, Ju Justice Kavanaugh's opinion from when he was uh, from, uh, you know, seal of law when he was on the DC circuit, all very squarely raised the question of, you know, is the FTC constitutional on an ongoing basis? And I think that the sort of very aggressive agenda that you're seeing from the current commissioner's leadership is, um, is is going to put that in jeopardy. Yeah, and by the way, when Christine Wilson said that, she didn't mean the fact that people tended to ignore her views. She meant that she was cut off from publishing certain kinds of things that she wanted to stay, getting access to certain kind of intimations and so forth. So that essentially what happened is one of the absolute preconditions of any, of any commission is that all of its members have equal access to every relevant document that everybody else had. And that when they publish things, it's not for the chief justice or the chief commissioner uh, to announce that I'm not going to allow this stuff to be put into the record. I'm going to keep it out. Now, how much of this has happened again? I'm not going to say, but certainly when her, her resignation statement made it very clear that this was not just a question that she was disappointed that she couldn't persuade them to change their mind. She thought in effect that she was being muzzled in a whole variety of ways. And once you see that, again, the claim for deference is absolutely shattered if it turns out the internal processes of the FTC are dominated by a chairman who has a very powerful uh, political agenda and is not at all hesitant about the way in which she starts to use it. Um, so I think, you know, what we are seeing here is, is a major debacle taking place. And one of the things that's clear about the Kagan opinion, there's no urgency about her opinion in terms of the way in which the underlying justice or injustice of a particular case takes place. It's not as though she wrote an opinion saying, well, let me tell you how uh, Ms. Cochran was put to the ringer. Let me show you the ridiculous terms that were going to be imposed by the FTC in this case. Um, I think if I remember, right, as she's, what they said is not only are we going to basically break up this merger, we're going to require one of the parties to give some of its intellectual property to the other party free of charge. I mean, I, they did say that, didn't they? I think they did. I see people nodding, but I, I mean, yeah. wait, where do they come from? There's just no authority whatsoever to do this. So on top of everything else, what you do is you certainly get a series of remedies that seem to be confiscatory in the way in which they operate. I mean, usually the thing that you do when you have a merger is exactly the opposite. The FTC stops it. You prevent them from going forward with integrated activities, which is a very high cost. 
so that it's easier for you to unscramble the omelet. Now what they do is they put them apart and they force a transfer as part of a situation, which is not a return to the status quo ante. So the whole thing has gotten uh, to the point where it's very genuinely bad. And I think we need to have some more explicit stuff on that. We need a series of cases with Brandeis briefs in which people basically show how it was that they have been ill-treated and ask the FCC or the SEC or the EPA to kind of justify this sort of situation. Remember, we have exactly the same problem with the EPA if you follow that stuff. Everybody knows what a navigable river is. It's a dry lot of land seated about a half a mile from a river, and you can't show a single drop of water coming from the land into the lake. But since there's a possibility that something might happen, we're going to stop you from building which is the Sackett case, which is before the Supreme Court right now. I mean, it's boggling how far these people have gone. And it's we not necessary. I mean, you remember Josh Wright wrote the statement in 2015, right? Remember, Ashish? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What he said is, I see Section 5, I see a Sherman Act and a Clayton Act violation. I don't see any residual authority. Now, nobody's going to have to fight over that, right? So, you know, do we really want to have a world where one guy is a, perfectly lawful and sensible person and somebody else turns out to be a renegade. That's the great problem that we have with the administrative state is the appointment power given the political division means there's too many flip-flops that start to take place inside the agency, which basically strengthens your point for saying, hey, um, this is a real political agency. But remember, giving the power back to the president, does that solve this problem? Not at all. Because what happens, he fires everybody who disagrees with him, which is what happened in one of these other cases. In the FHA, you know, in the, in the Collins case, whatever it was, he fired all the commissioners who <laughs> disagreed with him inside the Federal Housing Authority. I mean, you can't solve the problem oh. of extra politicization by giving the president greater power when he's a completely political animal. Well, but I mean, that's, <laughs> again, elections have consequences. And yeah, so, there are too many, unfortunately. Well, well, but that that's where you have, you know, that's where you have things like, you know, the, the revival of the major questions doctrine and non-delegation doctrine. And you know, ultimately you need accountability to, you know, the voters. And you know, part of the problem with the FTC's agenda right now is that they're acting as, you know, you know, a mini legislature. Right. I mean, you literally could have, my dog agrees, you literally have three um, you know, th you know, three individuals. Who could you know dictate rules for the entire U.S. economy, um, to, you know, just based on the thinnest of statutory reads? You know, one of the things to your to your point, Professor, about the costs that all this administrative uh, you know litigation is imposing on people. You know, one of the ideas that's being kicked around is an idea that on a going forward basis, uh, you know, nominees to the FTC would have have to have spent you know a minimum of five years in the private sector. You know, in the um, FTC strategic plan. They uh, eliminated language that said, "Yeah, you know, we're, we're going to we're going to force you know the laws of the FTC enforce, but we're going to try to do it in a way that minimizes costs mm -hmm. on the private sector." Which those of us who have served in government, you know, you all you all you always try always try to try try to be cognizant of, not the folks who are in charge now. So you know, when under you know President Obama, President Clinton, you had Democratic commissioners in place, they usually were people who had I mean, both some experience you know in law enforcement and some experience in industry you know even at law firms advising clients so they had some appreciation mm -hmm. for what companies are trying to do i don't think that the current leadership of the agency uh, has that well she's so I, want, I want to get to a couple of um of questions first which does tie in though to, to what we were, were all talking about um just a second ago which is uh, the first of which is the Axon decision allowed um, constitutional challenges to the structure of the FTC, but not, did not address the substance of those challenges, which of Axon structural challenges or similar claims are likely to succeed now that they can get to federal court, or you know which ones are relevant to um, you know, the current FTC and what cases we might see in the future? Well, I think what's happening is, I think the jurisdictional challenges can be brought immediately. And I think that that's absolutely critical given the aggressive nature of this particular agency. It would not have been particularly dramatic when Josh Wright, for example, was on the agency because he wouldn't have had things going like that. Remember, Trump himself was very insistent upon a fairly powerful enforcement mechanism through the FTC because he was something of a populist. He was not what you would want to call a markets consumer welfare economist. And the case that we have here, Exxon case, uh, that was a Trump FTC that made that decision, wasn't it? It wasn't the current bunch. Well, I mean, plague on both your houses when it comes 
to that. I mean, uh, about Trump, I've always had one expression, which is a la carte. Now, you take one thing from Trump and it may get anywhere from a one to 10. When you take the next thing, the first thing doesn't tell you anything about the second vote. So we can go from one to nine, back to three, up to eight. He's all over the lot because there's no intellectual consistency. Uh, the difference between him and the current administration is these guys are perfectly consistent and always wrong. I mean, it's really hard to find anything that they've done it's on the substantive measure that's worth salvaging. Everything they're trying to do is essentially to ban mergers. Um, not exactly, but so closely, particularly if they have any size of consequences. And, and that is just utterly ruinous for an economy because if you essentially take the merger option off the table for a startup, it's essentially one less reason to get into business. Um, some of these startups should not be merged. If you improve the securities law, it'd be easier for going public. So you want to change that as well. But the current situation is utterly intolerable and it's going to have a very bad long-term effect on the economy. I mean, there uh, the, it, it's open season in terms of, I think, credible cha constitutional challenges that can be brought against the FTC now. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, for Justice Thomas's opinion alone, you know, a challenge to you know the you know, the, the, the structure of the of the ALJ. That's actually in Justice Kagan's opinion, I mean, a majority opinion. Um, you know, the concerns about the you know the double, double removal. Uh, insulation of the FTC's ALJ. I think you're going to have um, uh, certainly just uh, you know a Humphreys executor style challenge. I think has at least a puncher's chance of succeeding. If you look at the composition of the court and what other justices have said about the agency, I think you know all of these you know various rulemakings that are coming down the pike uh, could be subject mm -hmm. to non-delegation, major questions, challenges to uh, federalism challenges on something like the non-compete rule, which has historically been uh, you know, some, uh, you know, the province of state law. So um, uh, buck, yeah. buckle up, as they say. Yeah, on the, yeah, on, the right, on the is not to compete problem. I mean, look, I've worked, I'm, I don't know whether I meet the five years private sector requirement that you have some fun. I'll assume I do not. But I've worked with a lot of people and essentially you get a former employee going into competition. There's a very clear rule. You get a six month period for a non-compete with existing clients in existing businesses, in existing locations, right? Now, are all of those covenants going to be made invalid? What it does is it means that to share information with your employees is going to become much more ticklish. Your current businesses are all going to be more inefficient. Are they, do they actually mean to stop that kind of an arrangement, Ashish? Uh, Ashley, do they? I hope not, but I, with these guys, you never know. To be to be determined, the the language of the proposed rulemaking is broad enough such that they say that any you know restraint on employment that you know, operates as a non compete could be subject to the FTC's rule. So I don't think we I don't I don't think there's clarity yet. Yeah, but and that I mean, this incentivizes to companies putting time into training new employees to you know doing yeah. that groundwork with those who are you know upper you know, mid-level sort of management um, that are, you know, part of their job by necessity is exercising trade secrets, right? So, you know, what do you do with that? It's really bad well, all around and not within their statutory authority. These guys understand nothing about trade-offs. I mean, we're not talking about a rule which one or another odd people have done. These rules, this the, the three sets of terms that I've given probably exist in millions of situations in which former employees leave to start new jobs um, and so forth. I think it's perfectly sensible on that. One of the things that I'm worried about is suppose you have a situation where somebody's worked for a company and they're going to be entitled to a bonus if they don't go into competition for the next six months. That is based upon previous work. Are, are we going to invalidate the covenant not to compete? And then if we do that, does all of a sudden the bonus get forfeited? Or uh, is this rule going to be essentially saying you can't delay compensation for work previously done or bonuses previously assigned for people to withdraw from their businesses? You just don't know what they're talking about. But what you do is you have absolutely complete confidence that no one inside that agency has actually thought about anything um, because they don't listen to anybody else. Um, and I mean, I, you just get so utterly alarmed about the, the kind of the presumptiveness with the way in which all of this stuff goes. Now, I wanted to make one other point. Um, one of the things you said about all of this is it's vital that we have mechanisms that if we're gonna have a lot of political executive authority, 
that essentially moderate the abrupt changes that are going to be made at the end of an administration to the other administration, right? Mm -hmm. I think we all kind of agree on that. Well, one of the things that the Biden administration has done is to undermine every long-term institutional practice that has facilitated that kind of an arrangement. And so you'll note he's very keen on firing all sorts of people who were appointed by the previous administration, even if they have term contract. Trump never did that. I'm actually suing Biden uh, on behalf of a bunch of clients because what he does with all the advisory committees uh, where he has where there are presidential appointments, he fired the Trump appointees and kept his own, even though these people are not executive officers. And even though it turns out that the whole point of these committees is to give independent advice to a president who may not like what he hears. And he goes into court and he wins. They say, well, you could fire him the way you could fire any attorney. So, so Professor, do you, do you disagree with the court, with the outcome in SELA law? Where uh, the court is, held that the essentially held that the CFPB director is terminable at will by the president. Oh no, I agree with that one. I mean, what I'm saying is, I, I think there's two things: uh, certain kinds of arrangement, hiring somebody on a contract at will, and then pointing them out is that one. But if you do have institutional arrangements, which is trying to distribute power, and you have somebody who's appointed for a five-year term in an administrative mm -hmm. position, the custom has always been to let them serve, right? So when Trump came into office, the general counsel of the NLRB remained the Democrat who had appointed before him. Biden's gotten rid of all those people. I think that's bad practice. But what I'm talking about on the advisory committee, these things were deliberately designed to have continuity in office and rotation by saying each president could appoint two people, each of them for three-year terms. And when then Trump goes ahead and fires his, rather Biden fires the four Trump appointees, on um, one now is noticed, either quit by five or you're basically fired by six. That is things to me makes it impossible to have, and there were 50 or 60 of these independent advisory commissions that would give you bipartisan view. And so that I think is illegal, absolutely illegal. These people are not federal employees. They're not like district attorney. Nobody before Biden ever thought to fire anybody on one of these commissions except Ronald Reagan, and he was thrashed into uh, compliance when he did so. And this is certainly not the same thing as having district attorneys, all of whom are expected to submit their resignations, right? Even if they have a term appointment, because they are standard kind of employees for which an at, for which specific performance is not to be given. But these guys are not employees. They can't do their job if the only people who are on these committees are yes men to the existing president. And if Biden does it to Trump appointees, then the next president could do it to Biden appointees, and the whole structure falls apart. Uh, so this fifth branch of government, on, and there's a regular statute about it, which tries to create continuity in office and rotation in office, is one that's also threatened by the Biden administration and accentuates the real changes that are going to happen uh, with administrations. That's the fear that you have, uh, the complete flip over, right? You go back to Josh Wright from Lena Khan, uh, everything, you know, all the other cases are going to be dismissed. And then you go back the other way and so forth. You tried to get some things, and permanent staff was basically that kind of device inside the FTC, right? Uh, and those are the people essentially being sacked, driven out of office, or ignored. Okay, so we have two minutes left, a minute from each of you. Um, final takeaways on the implications of Axon. Ishishi she, she first. Well, you know, great discussion. I think, I think, I think there are three. Um, going back to where we started, number one, I do, do, you, do you think it would been talking about this going to be you know open season on the Federal Trade Commission in terms of uh, constitutional challenges, but also statutory challenges to uh, you know the, the rulemakings that we all expect to be coming down the pike you know very soon. Uh, number two, I think that this um, does reopen the uh, you know very fundamental question about the FTC's uh, you know very constitutionality. The court did not take this up in this case. But certainly Justice Thomas's opinion is only going to add fuel to the fire for those who think that the FTC should not continue to exist as an agency that has you know, quasi-judicial, executive, and legislative authority. And number three, I think this is going to lead to a discussion, and probably a healthy discussion, about the, role, about the role of ALJs, both at the FTC, at the SEC, at other agencies, as contrasted to, say, um, you know, agencies like the Social Security Administration, that uh, where, where I would say there, there, there is some value to, you know, an ALJ type of function. So um, it's going to be interesting to watch. You know, I think that the single most important thing that comes out of this is not the destruction of independent agencies, but the refusal to allow them to have in-house adjudication in major cases with real consequences. 
but require them to go to some kind of independent body. I also think that if you are going to keep the current ALJ system, you're going to have to make sure that the head of the particular agency does not have the distinct power to appoint, but that some externally imposed rule of rotation is going to go there so that you can't always pick your friends on these particular cases. I also think that the arguments that the FCC is not expert on matters of the law is not only true about the jurisdictional issues over which they have a huge expertise, but it's also true of everything they do. And that what we have to do is to understand uh, that the basic situation that all questions of pure law are reviewable in courts has to apply to the board. Uh, the jurisdictional questions could get um, litigated very soon in the process before it takes place. Other ones could do only after appeal. But I think in the end, Chevron has to go because the way these agencies behave now, they're so weaponized that any presumption in favor of de deference is not a presumption to serve expertise. It's a presumption to serve very deep and intense partisan uh, agendas. Thank you. Um, I see we're now out of time, but um, thank you to both of our guests and thank you for everyone who attended this very last minute um, webinar on, on a decision that came out um, very early in the Supreme Court term. We, we were not expecting to see it quite so early in the year, um, but there it was. So um, I thank you all for coming out and um, please tune into our next webinar. Thanks, Ashley. Bye. Bye, Bye. Ashley. Thank you so much, guys. I see we're off the air now.